Hey, yo guys, I'm gonna be watching this video by Giant Grant Games. The next major RTS will fail, this is why. It's from about a year ago and I've never seen it before, but many people have told me about the video and it feels extra relevant now because I've been thinking a lot about RTSs that are coming up, such as Tempest Rising, Stormgate, and other games like Godsworn and Zero Space. And it makes you wonder, what chance do you think we have for an RTS to become as big as one of the beloved RTSs from the past. Uh, we're thinking about games like Command & Conquer Generals. Uh, we, we've got Age of Mythology, Age of Empires 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, Starcraft 1 and 2, Warcraft 3, uh, and so many other games. Beyond All, all Reason, and, uh, and there's more, Dawn of War. So why does he say the next major RTS will fail? Let's go take a look at this together. Strategy just isn't popular anymore. Real-time strategy just isn't popular anymore. Players much prefer MOBAs, shooters, and battle royale. And overall, that's kind of true, right? MOBA is one part of branching off of uh, RTSs and 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 reducing personal responsibility, reducing necessary key inputs, and increasing the uh, social aspect of the game. Developers will never invest in making one. There's no way to monetize it. No loot boxes or season passes. When a new title releases, it comes and goes with little fanfare. The player base dissipates in a few months, it can't sustain competitive ladder, and the game dies. RTS is a relic of gaming's past. As a content creator, I hear people say these things a lot when talking about the future of RTS, and honestly, I think they're full of it. People love to call doom and gloom. It's an easy alternative to critical thinking and analysis. People who remember the good old days of sitting on the gilded throne as the king of esports declaring that all is lost and the world has left them behind. While I disagree on their diagnosis why, they are correct about one thing. New RTS releases have been consistently bombing. I'm going to... Bombing. Consistently bombing? Yeah, it kind of hurt me actually to see the Reforged graphics there. I don't think Age of Empires 4 bombed. I think the gaming market got a lot broader away from the nerds that played games uh, in the previous millennium uh, uh, 1998 releases if you were a gamer in 1998 you were either a, a cool nerd or you were a not cool nerd but you were a nerd now everybody's a gamer right like you're not necessarily a nerd anymore and games that came out then compared to games that come out now are serving different audiences but people of my or our age still like games like this i don't think aoe4 bombed the peak players on steam uh, as listed on steam and it's also available on game pass so we don't know those numbers 74,000. Uh, the 24 hour peak uh, as of recently is something like 17,000 players uh, at the same time that is a relatively healthy sustainable player base but it is not up to the numbers of a pal world or something like uh, the, the latest Pokemon release. I don't think it is necessarily bombing though. Argue that the core problem with RTS right now stems not from the players, but from the developers. There's been a fundamental design philosophy shift for RTS. Developers and publishers have lost vision on what makes these games so much fun to play. I'm gonna have to agree a bit with that. I, I wanna see what arguments he's gonna give for it, but uh, there was something really fun about all these successful RTSs that captured the imagination of so many. Amazing sound design, for its time, really good graphics, right? And, and, and fun sound as well. The campaigns were interesting stories of things that didn't feel as much done before. Stories keep having to get better in order to not feel derivative or plagiaristic of a previous story. Right? I was more impressed with the Sarah Kerrigan uh, female left behind and corrupted storyline in StarCraft 1. And I was a little bit less impressed when the same thing happened to Sylvanas in Warcraft 3. It felt a little reminiscent. It was even from the same developer. And so if Blizzard brought out another game and there's another female left behind and corrupted by some evil entity and now turned into a vengeful spirit, uh, that's going to look very, very recognizable by now. So you see that as we get older, our entitlement for good creative stories does go up. Warcraft 1, 2 and Starcraft 1 had their own cliches and problems as well. But we weren't as critical. But by and large, all of these games had really fun aspects to them that made them popular. And it was pertinently not 
the multiplayer aspect per se that made them good. They were single player good games first and foremost. And if they don't change course, they are destined to a fate of mediocrity at best. They're targeting the wrong audience, not focusing on the correct content, and fundamentally misunderstanding who the average RTS player is. And if this doesn't get discussed, it will continue to happen again and again. Yeah, what's this? But why am I qualified to... And if this doesn't Great get discussed, goop. it will continue to happen again <laughs> and again. But why am I qualified to talk about this? In addition to the basic facts that I've played RTS for over 20 years now, have a career based around RTS, and run a large RTS community, I've also worked as an independent consultant for two currently unreleased smaller indie titles. This project work acted as the spark that inspired me to take up this project. Over the last few months, I've been surveying groups of RTS players, ranging from casual to hardcore, and I've received an absurd amount of feedback. The sample size of my data is currently 7,500 responses, an undeniably healthy data set. Using this data, my experience as a player and as a creator, I'm going to explain why the developers keep missing the mark, what old developers used to do differently, and how they can fix it. But before that, even if a developer makes the perfect game, there has to be people interested in playing it. So how many people are playing RTS right now in March 2022? The answer is way more than you think. Getting user data for games can be pretty difficult, so I'm going to have to focus on what is currently the largest RTS, StarCraft II. Together, we're going to walk through the steps to reach an approximation of the game's monthly average player base. StarCraft II is so good on an engine level. Like, it is it's such a clean game. It's such a clean game. It's such a golden standard for games. Unfortunately, Blizzard really hates giving out data about their player counts. Something about WoW's decline being very embarrassing for them to talk about. Blizzard is worried about declining number of WoW subscribers. Wow. About. Thankfully, StarCraft II had someone who was the embodiment of passion. And while Blizzard wasn't willing to talk about their numbers, one man was. On November 1st, 2017, Total Biscuit tweeted, Oh, and by the way, we've seen the numbers. SC2 has a consistent 1.8 million to 2 million monthly user base the entire year. So I guess Total Biscuit, uh, rest in peace, by the way, I miss that guy a lot. Uh, he would have been at the Blizzard office uh, and probably walked into the tel telemetry room. I've known about the telemetry room. I've seen it. I've seen it from the outside. I've never gone in and actually studied their, their data. But uh, 2 million monthly user base the entire year. 2 million monthly user base for the entire year in 2017. Yeah, that's uh, pretty damn healthy. That is seven years after its release. Co-op is extremely popular, Arcade has received a boost with the revamp, and there's a lot more coming. First of all, 2 million monthly users for a 7 year old game is absurd, yeah. but that data is over 4 years old now. It's not going to be correct for today. But thankfully, we do have some nice numbers of ladder games played both in 2017 and now. We can use that data to extrapolate the average <laughs> monthly player base for 2017. <laughs> the three seasons for the year of 2017 averaged 150,000, 140,000, and 131,000 games played per day. This makes a yearly average of 140,000. For the full year of 2021, the average was 193.8 thousand a 38.4% increase in number of ladder games played. Mm. This growth is almost That's crazy because the game went free to play in 2017 right after this tweet. Ah. Unless something incredibly unexpected is happening with the math here, that means that StarCraft 2's active player base is consistently and reliably over 2 million monthly active users. Yeah, so you realize actually the challenge that there is any StarCraft killer, right? Any RTS that would be a StarCraft killer uh would be required to get millions of monthly players and uh, i said age of empires 4 had had a pretty respectable concurrent viewership uh, concurrent playership and that's without the game pass players and this isn't concurrency the 2.5 million this 2.5 million is not concurrent right it is a uh, uh, total amount in the month so that's a little bit uh, different uh, it's going to be more for Age of Empires 4 then as well. But that's a lot. I also saw someone say, why does Stormgate, or another game, need to kill StarCraft 2? That's a bit weird. They can coexist. This is almost 12 years after the game's release, and two years of being with bare minimum support. The reason that new RTSs are failing is not because of a lack of potential players. So the RTS audience exists, but who are they? This might come as yeah, who are they i don't think they're i i think there's gonna be almost no sub 18 year olds 
play looking to play RTS at the moment. Every single developer that is making RTS games right now are thinking, how can we also appeal to that demographic? Very few will go into it and say, our ideal audience is people between 32 and 39 years old with some bleed over uh, at the edges, right? Because obviously they wanna have a bigger audience to sell to. This is a bit of a surprise, but even a decade after StarCraft II's release, the large majority of players and viewers are casuals. In my survey data, over three quarters of respondents self-identify as casual players with- Yeah, that makes sense. Um, we got the stats for, at some point we got stats for Warcraft 3 when they were talking about Reforged and, and, and StarCraft 1 remaster. And they said that the vast majority just plays the campaign in single player and never even goes online or maybe for one game max, right? And, and it was also something like 80%. Under 20% being hardcore. Uh, he said he did a, uh, is, th is this his survey that he did himself? Three quarters of the large majority of players and viewers are casuals. In my survey data over th his three quarters of respondents self-identify. His survey data is 75 people and his community is uh, RTS followers. He just mentioned he's an RTS content creator mainly. It's the same if I ask you guys about RTS, uh, how much of you have played RTS. Uh, you're going to have a very small percentage that doesn't because how many Fortnite only viewers are watching me right now? Oh, 7,500 survey size. Oh, I, th I, was, I was thinking like 75. He said it was indisputably a large sample size. I'm like, that doesn't sound that big, 75. But I mean, I was a bit skeptical. I didn't want to say anything. 7,500. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that, that is indisputably big. Uh, Little Saint, you only play Fortnite and the rest also all only play Fortnite. Okay, I see. As casual players with under 20% being hardcore. This data lines up- And it was in his audience, okay. Fairly well with a comment made by Matt Morris in an interview with Loco back in 2016. Like most people come into these games are- And Matt Morris in an interview with Loco back in 2016. Wilco, Loco. 16. Like most people come into these games are, you know, Wings Heart, they play the campaign. We see about 80% of the people that love the campaign and only 20% stick around for the- Yeah, there we go. This is the interview that I was referencing. And uh, let me let me move the chat away from uh, Matt Morris's beautiful face. I know he got dealt a stiff hand with the Reforged Remaster. I still like him. Core multiplayer. I mean, these are the really hardcore engaged. Oh, is, is that like 80, 80 to twenty? Yeah, it That's, drops like okay. that. So, you know, for a long time we've been saying, how how do we help these people stick around? Because they obviously love the game. I think this is part of the reason that it's kind of a problem when games come out like Painkiller which was an FPS looking to compete with arena shooters like Quake and Unreal Tournament. Painkiller came out and it was pretty much all about the multiplayer. They wanted to make an esports title. They invested something like $2 million in the CPL Pro Circuit in 2006. And they tried to bait all the Quake and Unreal Tournament players away from those games into Painkiller with money by sponsoring prize pools to the CPL and by hiring the CPL to uh, hold these tournaments for their game. They invested for about a month, uh, for about a year, $1.8 million or something. Uh, and then no one ever held any tournaments anymore. There were no third party organizers jumping on the game, putting in money because there was no organic, wait, there is a painkiller campaign and it's great. And it was super fun. All right, but no esports after that anymore. That game was my jam. All right, so it was a good game. I remember a lot of the Quake pro players that I spoke to said uh, they thought it was like quite nice, but that the reason they were playing it is because, you know, there was suddenly such a big tournament circuit, not organically being pulled to the game because yeah, that was their favorite game. While my question divides between hardcore and casual, while Matt Morris talks about co-op and campaign versus ranked multiplayer, there is a strong correlation between these groups. It's not bold to assume that the majority of self-described hardcore players focus on competition and esports while casuals prefer everything else. Which brings us to error number one of most modern RTSs, focusing on competitive ladder and esports. With game releases like Greg- Yeah, focusing on it first before everything else. Right? We need the casuals because the casuals are the bottom of the pyramid. So I, a hardcore RTS player, part of the 16% or so, I need the bottom of the pyramid for the peak of the pyramid to be higher.
closer to the closer to god goo and age of empires 4 the focus was entirely on why is grant's audio echoing oh uh let me wear a headset There is a bit of an echo, yeah. You would only hear it if you've got headset. Oh, and the music was still on, which I didn't even know. Or was it on? Okay, let's go. Where's the sound? Oh, there we go. Oh, when I switch audio source, it was on for 10 seconds. Oh, okay. When I switch audio source, it resets my audio balance. I see. Obvious afterthought. The AI for the folk and competitive ladder and esports. With game releases like Grey Goo and Age of Empires 4, the focus was entirely on multiplayer. The campaign was an obvious afterthought. The mm. AI was garbage, and at times it verged on unplayable. But this is alienating 80% of your audience. Yeah. In my polls, I asked how important it was for a game to have various aspects for people to give it a try. On a scale of 1 to 5, 1 was not important at all, and 5 was essential. Here's the data for having a campaign, cooperative content ranked 1v1, and... Let's see, campaign 68%, co-op 35, 21, 25. So they think it's very quite important. Campaign very important, one-on-one, -on -one, not important at all, 30%. Team play 2v2, less important, arcade important. So arcade is also like map editor and uh, spawning off different game modes. And then esports. Uh, so I am I am the minority. And an active esports scene. It's pretty obvious that the development focusing on creating a ranked multiplayer environment and pro play is not going to draw in the numbers. To double check these numbers, I went hunting through Steam achievements on various RTS games to see how many people are touching the multiplayer. Ah. I was shocked to see how low some of these numbers were. Iron Harvest sits at 19.4%. And oh, wow, okay. 19. Point Oh, so you can just have an achieve. That's super useful telemetry. You make an achievement of someone just starting a multiplayer game, and then you see how many people have it. Ah, 19%. Hey, that exactly backs, backs up the Matt Morris stat about 20% single player. It's the highest of the bunch. Company of Heroes 2 is 14.2%, Grey Goo 4.7%, and Ashes of the Singularity. What? Grey Goo has 4.7% of people that play only went. To multiplayer but i thought that he just said that this game was made for multiplayer great goo is win not play oh that's a mistake yeah it's a false equivalency yeah and uh, you're less likely to win your first i think you can assume that it's probably about 20 percent as well then depending on how good the matchmaker is it's 18 percent right now for iron harvest yeah pretty a measly 1.8 percent Though that last one is probably because everybody who boots that game has their GPU melt. Unfortunately, as far as I can tell, there's no achievement data for Age of Empires 4, but I would be surprised if it were a significant outlier here. So if ranked multiplayer is not the most important thing to an RTS title for most players, why do developers keep focusing on it? It's pretty simple. Selection bias. Developers want to make the best product that they can, and very yeah. often bring on active and important members of RTS communities to help give those communities what they want. Okay, right. I... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, I don't... <sighs> oh, that's your fault. <laughs> I, I did my best to try and imagine what it's like to be noob like you. All right. And to like casual things. But it's kind of like a lion trying to imagine what a sheep might like. It's like, where do you want the water to be? Right? Where does a sheep feel safe? I don't know. I have got nothing to fear. I'm trying to help here. I'm helping with like the important things like the top game balance and the uh, finer control mechanics and stuff. But yeah, a lot of my feedback might be useless for a noob. So for instance, when Age of Empires 4 had a problem with shift, I knew why it was happening. My video and my feedback led to it being fixed. I spent some hours on that. But noobs don't know why they're miscontrolling things with this shift problem that AOE4 had. They will never know why. They will just attribute it to their general being bad. Uh, bad from one thing, bad from the game, bad from themselves. They don't know the difference. They're just not very good. They just sent their army to attack and that's it. 
But yeah, it's true that uh, you need to hear from the casuals what they want. This is a great idea in theory. These people are very familiar with the scene in a way that developers can't be. But if you're a community member who makes their livelihood because of RTS, you aren't going to be a representative sample of the actual audience. So it's what Giant Grand Games is saying. Is it that you should listen to four grants every time you listen to one grubby? I think that's what he's saying. 20%, 80%. Being a literal RTS professional, be it player or con- That seems a bit advantageous for him. Tent creator makes you the definition of hardcore. And yes, that absolutely includes me. Of course the hardcore of the hardcore are gonna focus on 1v1. Oh, he's hardcore too. Even when they look at people who they see as less hardcore in their communities, they're so firmly integrated to the competitive community that they only see people with the same interests. I'm not saying it's wrong to create a game that caters solely to hardcore players, but- to it actually hurts me to see these horsemen walk into the spears. Is this gra giant grand games playing? Did he take footage for some from somewhere else, or is this him playing the campaign? If it is, <laughs> I would have called him hardcore. He's running horsemen into spears. But in his defense, I heard that he does uh, zero casualty runs of the Warcraft Three campaign. So respect. That's that's not easy, actually. Fair enough. with the same interests. I'm not saying it's wrong to create a game that caters solely to hardcore players, but developers should know that they are actively alienating a large portion of potential players by doing so. A tacked on afterthought of a campaign isn't gonna cut it. One more thing about audiences before we move on. There's a common misconception that the right RTS will grab all of the MOBA players and bring them back over from League or Dota. Uh, this idea is the right RTS will grab- There's still a StarCraft 2 scene, but the MOBAs that spawned from Dota, which descended from Warcraft 3, wildly overtook their parents, and they now rule. Maybe it will cycle back around. Oh, I hear the copium huffing out of the ears. Maybe it will cycle back around once someone finds a way to match it with whatever the hot new trend is a few years from now, but who knows. A mod for Warcraft 3 called Dota was made. It kept the combat, put more emphasis on hero powers while getting rid of base building. Most RTS fans switched over to what eventually started to be called MOBAs. Can we get them back? Can we get the Dota 2 players back and enjoy uh, the next RTS that feels like Dota, but it's a one-on-one? -on -one? If y I actually thought about these arguments as well, and I feel like the key to RTS is RTS hyphen RPG. There, I said it. RTS hyphen RPG. Like Warcraft 3. Stop trying to make StarCraft-like games. I'm still going to play them, by the way. Stormgate, Zero Space. Stop trying to make StarCraft-like. Make Warcraft-like. Which... Some people have. Spellforce 3 is kind of kind of Warcraft-like, but they have elements like... Uh, uh, and, and God Sworn is Warcraft-like, right? People like heroes. You need to make it fun. Give them some heroes. All of the MOBA players and bring them back over from League or Dota. This idea stemmed from the fact that Defense of the Ancients started off as a custom game mode for Warcraft 3, and thus all early MOBA players were RTS players. But you know, it kind of feels like... <laughs> It kind of feels like as likely for MOBA players like League and Dota to come back to RTS, so likely is it that US will come back to the Commonwealth United Kingdom. Warcraft 3 is almost 20 now. That doesn't apply to the modern MOBA player base. I polled about which genres RTS players tend to play, and MOBAs are behind RPGs, strategy games, FPSs, and sandbox games. If you feel like you need to bring in a different audience, you're better off catering towards Halo, Skyrim, and Kerbal Space program players. Better off catering towards Halo, Skyrim. So, see, RPG is the second category we like. Warcraft 3, Godsword, Spellforce 3. And then FPS, really? Hey, we're closer in DNA to FPS than MOBA. I feel like I just heard that humans are closer to octopus than to koala bears. Like, wow, I did not expect that leap. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's 93% uh, octopus DNA in us. And Kerbal Space Program players. Before we move on to the main points, I'm going to switch to Opinion Grant for a moment and talk about stuff. 
Given the niche I fill on YouTube and Twitch, I interact with a larger variety of casual and newcomers to the RTS genre than almost anybody else on Earth. My focus on campaign-based content makes me a natural springboard for people looking to get into the game. From this unique position, I've heard a lot of opinions and preconceptions about RTS and its players from more or less outside sources. And I think many of these are fairly problematic. StarCraft players in particular love to talk about how freaking hard the game is. How a ladder match is like playing chess and piano at the same time. How it's the most competitive one versus one game. How you physically can't click on the button to queue a Zerg unless your IQ is over 800. Basically I didn't see that one. I, and I think that's especially not true for Zerg. For Protoss, maybe. Zerg, you don't need that much IQ. You just need to be having a body like an athlete, right? You need to be like octopus hands. Either you need to be Korean or like very um, talented. <laughs> All right. You need to be very talented. <laughs> Rephrase. Basically, it's a lot of self-flattery, but it works. People see these views when they're looking into a game to play, and it's not a good thing. It makes people hesitant to try out the game. They're not sure they want to spend the time it takes to learn when the community makes it seem like you need a PhD to build a barracks. Yeah, the thing is, you can't change the messaging around how we advertise the game, can we? Like, can we? Can you really start influencing people? Hey, can we talk about RTS a little different? We're scaring away the kids. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, 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 I know it's hard, but uh, just get started and they'll learn it. I don't... I. I don't think we can change the messaging. It is what it is. I think it is hard. It is hard. And we're going to keep talking about it that way. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't think we can really change the messaging. I've worried sometimes that when I say how hard it is, that people are going to be like, well, I'm not going to get started then. Really? StarCraft 2 is that hard? Oh, I'm not going to get started. Uh, look at Dota 2. When I considered starting to play Dota 2, did people not warn me that it was toxic? Did I not find out when I started that it wasn't as bad, but it was partially true, but it wasn't as bad as I thought? And then 3000 hours later, did I not find out that actually it is kind of true? With 3000 hours of playtime almost, and that I need a little break so I can detox. You know, those warnings were real. Same thing about RTS, it is hard. But how come so many of us still got into those games decades ago? It was hard then too, right? But RTS, StarCraft, super popular, millions of people. Turns out humans can do hard things if they are worth doing, if they're fun enough. It's not too hard. It is hard, yes, but it's worth learning. And as long as you make it fun learning, I think this is part of the reason that the casual to competitive conversion rate is so low. People are intimidated. My experience with both the StarCraft and WarCraft communities is that once you're inside, they're kind, supporting, and fairly non-toxic. But from- That's true. Especially StarCraft scene. is slightly less toxic than WarCraft 3 scene, I would say. At least StarCraft 2. Maybe it's because they're generally younger? Less backwards or something? I don't know exactly why. From an outside perspective, we look like a bunch of self-aggrandizing elitists. So no wonder developers are trying to market towards that angle. Yeah, Warcraft 3 isn't that, isn't that toxic. It has a bit, but it's not that bad. I think it would be healthy to admit that while professional play is absolutely cutthroat and tense action all the way through, it's not that way for 99% of players. Yeah. If most people knew most ladder games were more like two drunk toddlers fencing with pool noodles, the intimidation factor would be significantly lower. And I think what helps StarCraft 2 a lot, I think he's right in what he just said, and I think what happens, what actually helps a lot is that uh, in StarCraft 2, you've got that many players, millions, right? And the more players you have, and uh, so long as there's a good matchmaking system, you will eventually actually end up meeting people that are bad enough for you to play against fairly. It is a problem for a dying or dwindling or static small game community that people keep on average getting a little better, which makes the barrier to entry quite difficult. Like, I just started Age of Mythology. And if I wanted to play online, which I did, I meet people that are pretty damn good. Right? I've, I, I had someone that teleported their army into my base and killed me. That was fun. 
right? That was my first online game. For me to now try and hope that I can meet other new players in Asian mythology, it's pretty much a 0.001% chance, right? So what? how do you get into the game when everyone's that good? Bigger player bases like SE2 that are also free to play, that are also really popular, that's easy to get into, you can start playing and you can suck and you will meet people that also suck. Which actually makes it quite difficult to have a new game start. The new game needs to have all the PR to get people into the game. It needs awareness, it needs a good launch, it needs good PR, trust from the fan into the developer. Uh, it needs to be exciting, it needs to be pog, it needs to be hype. So with all that out of the way, let's get to the core of this. What did old RTS have that was so successful yeah. that new RTSs are not doing? Yeah, it's worth see. stating that this is not a blanket truth. Many, many RTS have released in the past that have crashed and burned in ways that make recent releases look successful. Instead, we're going to look at the common themes from the three biggest success stories. These being the Age of Empires and Mythology series, Command and Conquer, and the Blizzard RTSs. Yeah. There are three pillars that these franchises had that allowed them to rise above and beyond and dominate the market for almost a decade. They are the engine, spectacle, and development tools. Engine, spectacle, to and development pillar, tools. I want to talk about the 2020 release Iron Harvest. This game is awesome. Post-World War I diesel punk mechs is an incredibly cool and unique setting. Looks the units cool. are stylized and varied from tiny walkers with machine guns to enormous monsters oh. with siege cannons. The visuals are pretty solid, the campaign voice acting is fun, and it's, it's consistently supported with DLC content. It's really astonishing how uninterested I am at playing any more of it. The game fundamentally fails what? in its most basic aspects, pathfinding and responsiveness. When a group of units is told to go to one place, they'll split up and head a variety of different directions. He had me in the first half. Making controlling even mid-sized armies a chore. Units are clunky, particularly large units take ages before they're able to execute commands, often creating frustrating situations where your most prized forces are sitting around like dunces while being killed. You're and I, I think like uh, saying, oh, well, the noobs won't care about proper control of their units. So what? The units are clunky. I feel like that's not doing enough justice to noobs. Like even noobs are not like 40 IQ troglodytes, right? That uh, or, or like three year olds that don't know what's going on on the screen. They're just happy if there's some images moving. Yes, I am. OK, but most people, my girlfriend is OK, nice. It relies heavily on a cover system for holding areas with infantry, but the outsides of most buildings can't actually be used for cover, with garrisoning being the only option. The oh, you know what Iron Harvest looks like? It looks like a company of heroes like uh, RTS, which uh, I barely specify as an RTS, but I've been having a lot of good discussions about this after my latest video on RTS, and I think I can start classifying it as follows. You've got StarCraft-like RTS, I also call this classic or hardcore RTS sometimes, but I think StarCraft-like covers the load. Under StarCraft-like, I would classify uh, Warcraft 3, Age of Empires 2, Age of Mythology, Age of Empires 4. I think they're all StarCraft-like, roughly. Of course, WC3 also has the heroes. I think StarCraft-like pretty much covers the load. It tells you what you need to know, that there's resource gathering, base building, unit control and a decent control scheme and engine there's a kind of polish to it when you say starcraft like otherwise rts could mean almost anything populous 2 is an rts frostpunk as people have said eh, that's a city builder sure but you know it's a possible rts uh, against the storm is an rts you see how wildly the definition can vary once you include anything under the umbrella so long as it's real time and has strategy so let's talk about Classic RTS or hardcore RTS, or even more specifically, StarCraft-like, which means that most RTSs that people tell me about, hey, have you seen this RTS? Actually, they're Company of Heroes-like. Or maybe we can use another game as the template for what that's like. Some people say real-time tactics, RTT, which is what this would be. So yeah, I don't feel like Iron Harvest should then be included and it shouldn't be held to the same standard of unit control because you can't see a game that, that's like this work in a competitive esports multiplayer capacity. But it can still be fun to control big badass mechs. It also means that there's not as much expectation from the engine that all the units move 
succinctly and properly and path correctly there really just isn't as much to it it isn't as deep it wasn't needed to be as deep so the developer just did it good enough and didn't need to pass the test of the top one percent of uh, appreciators or the top 20 percent of appreciators enemy will select a unit of yours to kill and if pulled back the ai will charge their most expensive units through your entire army to reach it yeah. i want to like iron harvest i really do but i just can't the game fundamentally feels bad to play many times how many people did like iron harvest he wants to like it he doesn't i probably wouldn't like it either it has 10,000 reviews, mostly positive, and I guess the people that didn't like it, it's the uh, control. See, he called it an RTS too, this reviewer. Gameplay, micro is poor, yeah, so it's not going to stand the test of time. It's just like a, a pretty face, like a one night stand kind of game. When you lose, it's not because the enemy out tactic or overpowered you, it's because you're fighting a 2v1 against the opponent and the game's controls. It's worth stating that some games in the past feel like that. StarCraft 1 doesn't feel good to play these days, but it was an upgrade from previous titles like Age of Empires, and then Age of Empires 2 was an upgrade from StarCraft, Red Alert was an upgrade from both, and that repeats over and over, each release being slightly better than the rest until mm. StarCraft 2, where no other- Debatable, I would say. I think the stylistic differences in world, in the atmosphere, and even the gameplay uh, doesn't mean it's all an upgrade, but they are at least worthy competitors some will like one more some will like the other yeah not 100 percent an upgrade the engine oh the engine yeah that's true oh yeah, yeah yeah that's true age of empires 2 has a better engine than starcraft 1 for the most part i think i only partially agree there starcraft 1 had its pathing issues but the control scheme was better and at least they had attack move which age of empires 2 does not other modern rts has matched the pathing or the controls RTS is a genre where you're going to have to spend significantly more time on the fundamentals. Gorgeous aesthetics mean nothing if the player is focusing all of their attention on trying to get the unit to move properly. Yeah. Incredible sound design for attacks is worthless if units can't find their way to the battlefield. In games like shooters, the tech- I mean, I think it's fine if you just play a game and you're looking to just kind of play the campaign and, you know, you just attack, move, and watch. I think that's what the developers hoped for this game to be. Like you just fight and they don't get the pros to come in. They get the company of heroes. Obviously this is like aiming at the same audience as company of heroes, Warhammer, Age of Sigmar. A lot of these games aren't that well built on the engine level, right? But they still keep getting made, which means they're probably fulfilling a niche of sm small scale profitability. Technical investment is far lower. Engines come with pre-provided tools and developers have a firm understanding of the genre by now. But RTS needs a little bit more care under the hood. For all you executives and project managers out there, it might seem difficult to justify spending all the extra time and money on getting these fundamentals correct. Yeah. But I promise you that by the end of this video, you will understand that this is not a barrier to entry for the genre, but instead an investment into saving more time, effort, and money down the line. Yeah, they, they, they may agree with that. They may disagree with that. I guess we'll see. One thing I find incredibly fascinating about the big three is they managed to span all of the main settings of gaming. Age of Empires was historical. Command and Conquer was modern fantasy. Warcraft was high fantasy and Starcraft was sci-fi. Despite the settings being so wildly different. I wish he used classic graphics for Reforged. It looks so much better than this dark mess. Reforged mess. Each of these games do a great job with the second pillar, Spectacle. Spectacle doesn't need much explanation. Cool things are cool, and using cool things is fun. Yeah. Yeah, I feel that sense of spectacle in StarCraft. I feel that sense of spectacle in Age of Mythology. I haven't played enough AoE 2, especially the campaign, to know. Warcraft 3 definitely has it. And I guess everyone is wondering, will Stormgate have it? Spectacle? Age of Empires allowed players to recreate history in a way that was completely novel at the time. Age Mythology brought literal deities into the mix, dropping meteors and thunderstorms on your opponent before moving in with an army of minotaurs and chimera. Yeah, Command and cool. Conquer started fairly average, but it dialed up to 11 with the Red Alert series. Weather control, Tesla coil troopers, zeppelins, mind controlling enemies to run them into a grinder to harvest them for resources? It's crazy! Warcraft hit all the fantasy notes. Pillaging your foes with orcs, ambushing as elves, powerful heroes that shape the yeah. around them. 
a huge, diverse selection of third-party creeps that can be both fought for rewards and hired as mercenaries. And finally, StarCraft's far future Protoss facing against the hillbilly Terrans with janky explosives. And of course, the Zerg rushes that are so iconic that they've become a basic part of gaming jargon. Spectacle is what you put on the box art, on the Steam page. It's oh what draws God. people- Look at that box art. Jargon. Spectacle. Look at this. Oh man. Oh man. That was so cool. I remember holding this box in my hand. No, actually this is StarCraft 2. Let's let's sit down by the fire for a second. I remember holding the box of StarCraft 1 in my hands. <laughs> and Warcraft 3, wondering if my dad's gonna buy me the game. ...is what you put on the box art, on the Steam page. It's what draws people in, and then starts to get them thinking. When things are crazy and wild, the player gets excited to find new interactions and combos. Ways to rush towards their favorite unit, ways to make it work, even if it's a little bit underpowered. Yeah, he As the, the design game. focus has shifted towards multiplayer first, a lot of spectacle has been cut. Decimating armies with an invulnerable Soviet tank line with the Iron Curtain just isn't fair in multiplayer. Yeah. You can't have your- The same in Godsorn, right, that we recently looked at. You get this massive kind of thermonuclear missile, fantasy style, where you just blow up the opponent's base. Does friendly fire as well, by the way. Really cool to put in an RTS where you're playing against AI or casual RTS. Not very balanced in MP multiplayer. Very mind control enemies and grind them up for cash, it's too cost efficient. When the design is for multiplayer first, you inevitably cut the things that should be selling your product. A good example of getting this balance right is StarCraft II. So we had all these ideas while developing StarCraft II that we thought were pretty cool. We had units like the Diamondback, which is this tank that can move and shoot at the same time. Well, it turned out it stepped a lot on the Marauder. It stepped even a little bit on the Siege tank in terms of its role. These units were too similar. And it wasn't actually that easy to control. It was actually very difficult to manage what this thing was shooting at while you're moving it. This guy wasn't for esports. We had a Spectre. It's a new type of ghost. This guy's going to be cool. Oh, okay, well now we got two ghosts. You're going to pick <laughs> one. You're not going to use the other one. Not exactly the epitome of spectacular uh, design, though. Like, I get why you can't have two ghosts, but <laughs> it's not spectacular. <laughs> um, and we didn't really want to cut the ghost. It seemed kind of core to what StarCraft was all about. Um, so not for esports, the poor Spectre. But these are all- I love the RTS talk. I feel like devs need to separate single and multiplayer more. Me and my friends love to turtle against Max hardest AI, like in Supreme Commander. But in multiplayer, the game was completely different and sucked pretty hard, in my opinion. Warcraft 3 Age of Empires 2 had great single and MP. That's why they were awesome. The noobs can enjoy playing against AI and the pros play multiplayer. Yeah, that's uh, the dream for any developer to do. Like Frost Giant is trying to do this by creating a game mode PvE 3 versus E, which I am personally not interested in at all, but then also one on one, which I am interested in. So it would be like you and me. We go to a picnic and you're eating like coleslaw salad and uh, I'm eating like a cool manly hot dog, but we're still sitting on the same picnic mat. Oh, cool. These are all units that in any other game I'd ever worked on, I absolutely would have put in. But since those other games weren't designed to be an eSport, they made no sense for StarCraft. But we wanted them in the game. We felt like we've done the art. They're fun units to play with. Why should the consumer not have the opportunity to play with these? Yeah, coleslaw can also be manly. It could have been either way around. And so we tried to find places we could put these. Though, I would argue that they didn't go far enough. Originally, the Thor was going to be a unit so massive that it had to be built by SCVs on the field. Yeah, I remember that. I was really disappointed that didn't make it into the game. Battlecruisers were going to have custom weapon attachments like plasma <laughs> torpedoes that had to be individually upgraded. The mothership could stop time, crack planets, and create- Yeah, I dude, it was so exciting when they unveiled the mothership planet cracker that just everything would die underneath. Sad it didn't make it into the game too. I love this. When I saw the final mothership where it just had recall, cloak, and uh, black hole, I was like, yo, where's the planet cracker? You promised. Insta-kill black holes. The fact that we never got to play with these is honestly disappointing. I'm not saying that competitive multiplayer should be filled to the brim with broken game-ending super weapons, but I feel like each faction should be designed with absurdity in mind. Make yeah. it ridiculous for the single-player experience, and then trim it down to what's fair. 
I think it is possible, probably. It may not have been totally done before, but I think it is possible. Isn't the StarCraft 1 and StarCraft 2 nuclear missile from the Ghost kind of that? It's way too powerful. It can blow up 120 population of carriers. However, it has a really big drawback. There is a red dot that says where it's going to happen, and it's on something like a 15, 20 second delay so that there's a chance to find it. It is valid at pro play and it is valid at casual play, but it always has counterplay. So I think that's how you balance it. I think that makes it still possible. Look at Dota 2. Dota 2 is a multiplayer game. It is very esports ready. It's very suitable for high level competition. Very suitable for newbies too. People in Herald have as much fun as people in pro play. Yeah, people in bronze and pro play. And yet Dota 2 everything is broken everything is imbalanced and therefore perhaps nothing is air for multiplayer boring uninspired units and abilities are all too common in recent rts cool stuff sells at this point you have a game with a strong fundamental base you've designed bombastic over the top units to energize and inspire the player base but you don't get to make a game just yet now is the time to put effort into making a great editor not just yes. a good editor, a great editor. This is the final pillar of successful RTF. True. Age of Empires 2 has so much replayability because of it. Warcraft 3, Starcraft 2, Starcraft 1, all because of the editor. You know what doesn't have an editor like that? Heroes of the Storm. I know it's not an RTS, but it's a game that had a lot of interest and a lot of potential. It's a very fun game that could have been so much more if there was an editor. Unfortunately, Blizzard was getting really stingy with sharing their IP, and so they just said, no editor. Yes. The terrain, mission scripting, triggers, cutscenes, and even the AI should all be created inside of the modules of this editor. It is the Swiss army knife that creates every piece of the game that the player interacts with. We all know the gaming scene has changed in the last 20 years. You can no longer get away with launching a product, a year later popping out an expansion, and calling it a day. Games as a service is the new normal. The new goal is the constant progressive creation and distribution of content in a game so that the players will continue to stick around. A powerful editor allows developers to create that. This is actually the key for almost every other popular game that's not RTS as well. Modability. Content at a rapid pace. Take Age of Empires 2 for instance. The game initially launched with five campaigns, and as time went on, due to having a well-designed editor, campaigns have continued to be made and sold. As of right in fact <laughs> it is probably the only reason starfield is still popular and has people defending it skyrim starfield by the way i'm gonna play uh, skyrim soon writing this the game has a staggering 33 available campaigns with almost 250 missions this wow. is an incredible amount of content to be pushing out a constant way to reliably draw players back into the ecosystem, getting them hyped for the next content release. A powerful editor also gives the flexibility to capitalize on things that have accidentally become successful. StarCraft II's co-op commander system was initially a tiny side project when it debuted in 2015. It was considered less important than Legacy of the Void's campaign, the mission packs, and of course the star of the show according to Blizzard, Archon Mode. Which, uh, by the way, I don't think if StarCraft II led with co-op commanders, would it have been successful? I I asked um, I asked if okay. Let me let me see. Let me say this properly. Oh yeah, I I asked my wife if she would still play co-op commanders with me right now in current day, even though she doesn't play StarCraft at all. And she said it'd be super fun. Why? Because she started playing StarCraft 1 before we even met. She played StarCraft 2 after we got together. I started on SE2, she started on SE2. She likes the game, she played solo, she played custom maps. Because you're already playing the game, because you already did the campaign, because you already do multiplayer, then co-op commander comes out, you know the whole cast already, you know the whole characters, you know the world. Now just suddenly starting co-op in another new game. I wonder why you would choose RTS over something like um, We Were Here 2 or Portal or um, the, one of those cooking games. There's like lots of cooperative games you can play on Steam. But why would you play cooperative 
RTS, if you have no affiliation to the world, if you have no familiarity with the systems, I suppose in theory you could. The, the counter question is why not? Yeah, it takes two, right? But there's already a brand here. And so if I created a new game, for instance, Stormgate, they're, they're trying to be like, uh, Yo, you know, this is what the casuals are gonna be playing, 3VE, but there is no um, story yet that people care about. Right, so you want to get the story first. You draw them in with, yeah, I agree with this guy a lot with giant grand games. You draw them in with spectacle. You've got a world. It's a rich world. Now there's co-op, so you feel things. I play a Zeratul. I feel things because I know Zeratul. Well, it turned out Archon Mode sucked and was a complete failure, but co-op was incredibly successful, and Blizzard was able to rapidly expand on it, turning it from a selection of six heroes to the current 18, as well as adding in a mutator and prestige system for massive levels of replayability off of a very small development team. If yeah, so they added a roguelike system to it, essentially. And uh, co-op commander is a lot of fun. It became number one mode for StarCraft. And I think that's why the the new RTSs, sometimes they're thinking, hey, uh, we should be like that. Especially ex-Blizzard guys, right? Because they saw that from the inside. They saw the stats. Co-op commander is the biggest thing that people do now for SC2. And, or maybe, I don't know if it's the most players, but it made them the most money. If the editor they were working with was not as robust, flexible, and easy to use, that opportunity would have left them by the wayside. True. But now, I have to admit, I've been a bit misleading so far. I said that these <gasps> three pillars provided the support that old school RTSs had that led them to greatness, and that modern releases failed because they didn't have them. But that's not exactly it. These pillars serve as the catalyst for the true reason. What mm. is the most powerful force in all of gaming? The critical co what, what is it? APM? The most powerful force in all of gaming. APM. Fun? Fun, probably. Or of the genre that has been lost and must return for success. Social system? Bnet 1 was better than Bnet 2? That's full game. Of course, I'm talking about player-generated content. Oh, yeah. Yeah, ModDB is a website for modding games, with a focus on older titles. It's not as big as places like the Steam Workshop or Nexus Mods, but it's been around for a while. Slightly more recent games like Minecraft have 2 million mod downloads there, while some of the bigger titles from the old days like Half-Life and GTA San Andreas have almost 9 million mods. Yeah, I thought we already talked about that in the previous section when we talked about co-op commanders. I assumed it was got to do with the mod uh, part of the game, but yeah, that's true. Replayability is built on uh, modding downloads. That is a lot, but it's also unsurprising. GTA and Half-Life are not just big brands, they're cultural juggernauts in gaming. What is surprising is that both of these are dwarfed by Medieval 2 Total War's 11 million downloads Damn. and Command and & Conquer General's 13 million. Holy. But why? These are both good games, but neither are iconic pieces of gaming history. Are I have sometimes discarded other RTS games or other games as maybe not being as important to gaming history, but I would imagine that these stats actually disprove that. Probably Giant Grand Games has a bit of a blind spot here, as I've recently had to admit as well, based on some comments to my RTS videos recently uh, on Grubby Talks. So yeah, probably this is more iconic than he or I thought so. Hi, these are both good games, but neither are iconic pieces of gaming history. So I think they are. They are iconic because tens of millions of people played it. RTS is specifically well suited towards user made content. The top down perspective is significantly less restrictive on creative freedom than the first or third person cameras. An RTS with a good editor serves as a blank canvas for an inspired creator to build what they want. And while the average creation might be pretty mundane, there have been multiple instances where entire genres have been spawned from these editors, like yeah. tower defense and MOBAs. Yep. The reason that the focus on custom content was dropped was largely due to emulation. Developers saw that StarCraft II launched with a pretty terrible custom game section and determined it wasn't an important part of their- Oh my god, I just remembered the arcade! The arcade for StarCraft II. It was so good in StarCraft 1, it was so good in Warcraft 3, not perfect by any means, but good enough. In StarCraft 1, games list refreshed every now and then. 
it would just refresh and show you a different list. I don't know exactly how it worked, but it just worked. When I was in my teens, I knew that if I made a StarCraft 1 map and I called it 1v1 melee join, yeah, some people would join, some not. It was my first experience of how to make clickbait titles. And now I'm a YouTuber, go figure. Right? If you just said 1v1 melee serious, not a lot of people joined. But if you said 1v1 go, 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 you noob, more people would join. And it just worked. Like you were playing the algorithm of the naming system already. I don't know exactly how it worked, but it just worked. You made a name and people would join. I remember discussing with my brother sometimes, we'd be discussing how to name the game so that people would join our custom map, right? And uh, in Warcraft 3, it also worked. If you wanted to play tower defense, Dota, or anything, especially before Dota got, started getting gated by the third-party websites and you know checking your rank and third-party apps and whatnot, you could just join games and just start playing. But then in StarCraft Arcade, everything was grouped under one game. And to be fair, that's kind of how Dota 2 works, that you choose an opt into categories of known mods and it will then auto seed lobbies. But in Warcraft 3, lobbies were still distinct independent lobbies. And Arcade for StarCraft tried to use the Dota 2 system with pre grouped maps, but it just didn't work. Like it wasn't fun to join, uh, the searching was bad. They just sucked at making it. Their own RTS. But this wasn't an intentional act by Blizzard, it was the arcade not being ready in time. Yeah. I would argue that the two years it took for a good system to play user-generated content with people was StarCraft's greatest flaw. and that. Yeah, one of the big flaws, definitely. I mean, this was already like starting to go necrotic Blizzard. Starting to die off Blizzard. You could see that the way StarCraft 2 was handled and Heroes of the Storm soon after it that uh, this wasn't peak Blizzard anymore. I think peak Blizzard, you know, between 1998 to probably 2007. I could see it too, you know, when I went to the BlizzCons. I went to BlizzCon in 2004, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. There was one year where they didn't hold it, didn't go obviously. I pretty much went to all of them. And then from like 2008 onwards, the culture started feeling different. You could tell already. You saw fewer of the long-haired, nerdy dudes that loved watching their own game. And you saw more and more people coming in from ESPN, the business world, suits. You could see it in the warmth of the eyes of the staff of Blizzard. Before, I would have rapport with them. We'd talk. They were kind. They were patient. After that, they were more aloof, colder eyes, etc. You had like the suits coming in. So like I saw that change happening from the inside. Yeah, understandable that it would also lead to like policy changes on games and mistakes being made. Games being released without full feature sets became much more common ground. The shitty arcade and the very shitty Battle.net system of StarCraft 2. I, I, he, he said the arcade uh, not being ready was one of its biggest flaws or maybe the biggest flaw. I think the social system for Bnet was another one. We went from a Bnet where, yes, sometimes there was toxicity in the general chat, but at least you had a sense of community. Even if that community was a little cheeky, even if the first time I showed my niece StarCraft 1, there was immediately insults, not directed at us, thankfully, about people's parents and about how copulation with other people's parents might be in the cards sometime soon. That was embarrassing. That was her first look of StarCraft 1, and I was trying to show this cool game, and you were plopped right into the general chat where that was happening. But at the very least, it felt alive, like the crazy people on the town square shouting, but you still live in a village. Battle.net 2.0 felt austere, desolate, and lonely. And that's not a good feeling. Dota 2 feels a lot more alive than Heroes of the Storm or StarCraft 2 when you're inside the client. Simply by all the game activity of your friends. You see games in session all the time. And that's a, it's a fun environment to play in. StarCraft 2 had that lacking as well. You pretty much didn't talk to anyone via SE2. You would just use third-party apps. Whereas in Warcraft 3, 
Diablo 2. It was pretty fun to whisper and chat with people and go to general chats and just shoot the shit. Copycats are not following success, but have instead been repeating a mistake. In the early 2000s, RTS had a dominant position on the player-generated content scene. In 2010, with the launch of StarCraft II, that dried up. It's not like that creativity and passion to build has disappeared. It just yeah. went that dried up. StarCraft II was also... People ...was StarCraft's greatest flaw, and that copycats are not following success, but have... Uh, StarCraft 2 is also very difficult to program for, so I understand. I'm not a programmer and I haven't made a lot of maps. The last time I made programming work was in QBasic and Warcraft 2. I never tried programming in Warcraft 3 or StarCraft 2. So you see my skills are a little outdated and limited. But uh, I hear that SE2 programming pretty much requires you to be quite good at programming. You're not just using like a simple interface and uh, interface and picking some things. You actually need to know some pretty complicated stuff. Instead been repeating a mistake. In the early 2000s, RTS had a dominant position on the player-generated content scene. Yeah. In 2010, with the launch of StarCraft II, that dried up. It's True. not like- True. And then all the creative people are gonna go somewhere else. That creativity and passion to build has disappeared. It just went somewhere else. Because one year later, in 2011, Minecraft launched. No, and if no. you ask anybody age 12 to 22, they can firmly tell you that while Minecraft was fun on its own, the best part was the mods. There was an absurd selection of unique game modes that captivated not just audiences, but also viewers, launching countless careers of Minecraft YouTubers who explored, highlighted, and played through. Th imagine, if, uh, imagine if Dota 2 came out half a year to a year later. Icefrog would have been a Minecraft modder. Awareness sets in. These. The players were given a powerful tool to create and proceeded to do not only that, but also organically market those creations to both each other as well as the wider world with minimal developer input. This has proven to work not only in Minecraft, but in other games as well. Skyrim is famous for its insane levels of modability, and it just so happens to be the best selling RPG ever if you don't include Pokemon. The, the engine. The, Tommy. The best-selling Halo game is Halo 3, which just so happened to be the one that includes The Forge, which was by far the best way to create and share custom games in a shooter at the time. Kerbal Space Program spent the majority of its life as a bare-bones spaceship simulator brought to life by the easy-to-use CCAN mod manager. <laughs> and don't even get me started about Half-Life mods, where people created niche modes like Counter-Strike and whatever the heck Gary's mod is. <laughs> what is and that? despite all of these high-profile hits and Minecraft being the best-selling game of all time, none of them are the most successful game to follow this formula. Roblox is. I'm gonna yeah. put aside the questionable ethics. This is what all the kids play. Roblox and Minecraft and Fortnite. Every time I ask someone under 18 from IRL, like nieces, nephews, friends, kids, it's always these games. I have this vision, like I'm, I'm not a father and you know, I'm not looking to be, uh, but uh, my hypothetical kid trying to imagine that they would elect Fortnite over Warcraft 3, even growing up in my household where that's uh, maybe, I don't want to say frowned upon, but not encouraged. That that's scary. That's a scary thought. That's a scary thought. I I like to disown them potentially. Yeah, I would say potentially. So the Roblox Corporation right now, people make games already did a great video on that topic. And instead, just focus on the numbers. Roblox. Yeah, Roblox has some controversies, right? He said he's not going to focus on it. Make games already did a great video on that topic. Instead, just focus on the numbers. Roblox is only a platform for users to create games, share them, and play each other's creations. Roblox has 200 million oh monthly my active god. users. Oh my god! Just step up. Oh. Imagine. Oh my god. Imagine they were all playing RTS. That would be cool. At the time I'm writing this, Roblox has the same number of players as the top three Steam games combined. This formula of making a solid basis for players to create custom content works. It was proven with Battle.net and StarCraft 1. It was reaffirmed with the custom games section of Warcraft 3. It was driven to ridiculous proportions with Minecraft. <laughs> and then Roblox came and drove the point home. Oh, RTS man. is a great platform for making this content. This content is immensely popular. The RTS player base skews towards older gamers. 
And right now, there's a large Wait, hold on. The RTS. Pl hold up, hold up. Oh, shit. RTS lends itself to user generated content. User generated content is popular. RTS players are older. Oh, man. 13.2%. Player base skews towards older gamers. And right now, there is a large number of now older gamers who grew up with Minecraft. Doesn't it mean that the opposite of society in general is true in games? You know, like in general in society, old people are lame and young people are cool and young people think old people are lame. But in RTS, in games, it's kind of the opposite. Now we're the cool ones and uh, Roblox players are lame. No? Is it, is it? You are lame to that? Well, it's, but it's it's the opposite though now. No? Okay. Man shouts at cloud, okay. The math makes sense. Throughout the entire history of RTS, the common theme between the dominant titles has been creator agency. There's a fundamental limit to what a development team can do for a game. They can only make so much content. And after release, they're stuck in maintenance mode, running yeah. around, putting out fires and squashing bugs instead of developing new content. True. When the community is empowered, the creation process can continue. When things are created and promoted, they draw <laughs> in more players. And when more players are drawn in, some of them will become creators. Holy this shit. is the feedback loop that is key for creating a successful title. When Sorry, I... Uh... I was just looking at the massive Void Prison. I didn't hear what he said. Uh, void Prison? Void Ray. Moded, they draw in more players. And when more players are drawn in, some of them will become creators. This is the feedback loop that is key for creating a successful title. When you log into an RTS that's destined to fail, you log into a campaign and a 1v1 ladder. But for the kings of the genre, it's not just these things. It's a MOBA, a unit spawner, a tower defense, a hero arena, a Sims game. It's a cat and mouse, Mario Party, and Risk. It's even this weird Toho anime thing that I absolutely know nothing about, but if I did, Marisa would be best girl, don't at me. It's an auto battler, a card game, a tug of war. It's mafia, bejeweled- Oh my god, there's an auto battler in StarCraft. There's anime games. A typing game. It's a freaking MMO shooter. It's a way to be competitive and a way to play with your friends. None of these things were made by the- Yo, we should play some of these StarCraft maps. They look fun. Developers. But all of them were made possible because of the developer. The reason that the next RTS will fail is a fundamental misunderstanding of what the S in RTS stands for. The first developer who understands that the S is not strategy, but instead stands for sandbox, will be the new king of the playground. Oh my god, real-time sandbox. We are redefining... RTS genre name. Strategy, but instead stands for sandbox, will be the new king of the playground. Thanks for watching. If you want to see for yourself some of the amazing work of the StarCraft II modding community, check out my daily uploads channel, Giant Grant Games Archives. I'm currently playing through Legacy of the Taldorim, a fun mod where you play through Legacy of the Void as a custom Taldorim faction, with both co-op units and a host of new awesome ones. I'm also starting the UED AI project, whose goal is to turn the brain-dead StarCraft 1 AI into an intelligent monster. And on <laughs> Twitch for the next couple weekends, I'll be playing through the 7-player Wings of Liberty mod with random viewers. It's going to be the most chaotic, best, worst thing I have ever played. If you're interested, I hope you can check it out. And either way, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be here, and I hope the rest of your day is wonderful. Peace. Cool. Hell over. So why uh, why uh, is the next big RTS gonna fail? Because they're not including sandbox. Well, real time. Some of them are including sandbox, and then it's up to whether the game has enough attraction power and then staying power. We'll we'll have to wait and see. 2024, 2025, 2026. Let's see what comes up. I'm looking forward to whatever is coming. I'll try them out, and I'll give you my grubby thoughts on them. Cool video, up, dude and share.